So can you hear me? Hello everyone, my name is Jens Müller. I recently earned my IT security master's degree at the University of Bochum. And now I'm a prospective PhD student at the JFRO Network in Data Security at the University of Bochum. Today, I will give you an introduction on our current research, a joint work on printer security. Well, you may ask, why would anybody want to attack printers? Why does it matter to you? Well, printers are just simply everywhere. They're contained in every household, in every company, in every educational institution. And they have access to quite sensitive information, like business contracts being printed, like patient recipes, for example, like yet unpublished research. And today, I'm going to show you how incredibly easy it is to access this data based on 35-year-old vulnerabilities present in almost any laser printer. Apart from attacking the printer directly to get confidential data, um, taking over the printer to escalate into a company's network using the printer as a starting point may also be a relevant scenario. So the printer may be the weakest link in your IT security chain. So definitely lots of uh, motivation to have a deeper look at those devices. Undoubtedly, printers have evolved. 30 years ago, we had simple mechanical devices that did nothing but print or produce a paper jam from time to time. Well, nowadays, um, you cannot buy a printer without actually buying a full-blown computer system with um, advanced operating system, full TCP IP stack, um, additional functionality such as fax and scanning often included. And you can even install a printer apps. So I've got um, package management on many, many modern devices. So the only thing that didn't change maybe is that always when you're in a hurry and you want to print something, the printer will definitely produce a printer a paper jam. So, um, what does make printers special? All our devices are getting smarter and smarter, or maybe not so smart. Um, so what is so special about printers? Beyond all the traditional security problems that we have with embedded devices, in the printing world, we have got some design weakness by default that is um, extra interesting. You can, for example, access the printer's file system through ordinary print shops. You can access the printer's memory through ordinary print shops. Even firmware updates are deployed as ordinary print shops. So as you can see, there is no distinction between documents being printed and administrative functionality to actually control the device. Basically, you got data and code over the same channel, and we always know that this is a bad idea. And such a security weakness by design is uh, shared by all laser printers. Okay, what are our main uh, contributions? Uh, we performed a systematization of um, attacks against network printers. Some of them are novel, some of them are well known. And we evaluated um, the attacks on uh, 20 printer models of uh, different manufacturers. Using a Python tool, we wrote the uh, printer exploitation toolkit called Brad. Also, I'm going to show you some uh, novel attacks beyond printers and some new research directions. Okay, here's an outline of today's talk. First, I need to give you a little bit of background information on printing technologies. So it is uh, easier to follow the, uh, the attacks, actually. Um, and then I'm going to give an evaluation a short introduction to our BRAD tool, and I'm trying to adapt the attacks to um, areas beyond printing, like to websites, for example. There's a web conference, right? And I'm going to show you some countermeasures so you can protect your devices. Okay, let's start with some background information. Well, what does it actually mean to print? It means basically two things. First, you need to decide which channel you use for printing, obviously, like USB cable, like one of various network printing protocols. The second thing is you need to select a printer language, so a language that is directly understood 
by the printer, for example, PostScript. And what your printer driver actually does is, is it uh, translates the document to be printed into the language that is directly understood by the printer. And PGL and PostScript are pretty interesting because both languages are supported by almost any laser printer device out there. Okay, what can we attack in the printer context? Well, we got some kind of mechanical printer unit. We don't really care about that one. We've got a PGL interpreter. We've got usually a PostScript interpreter. And we may have further interpreters for printer languages like PCL, like di direct PDF printing, or um, some proprietary languages supported by some vendors. And when you print a protocol, um, a document using, um, for example, USB cable, what you can do is you can, for example, send PostScript data to the USB port, which is interpreted by the PostScript interpreter, and finally put to paper by the printing unit. But you can also use one of various other printing channels, for example, one of various network protocols like raw network printing over port 9100 TCP. The interesting thing here is that just like USB, you get a bidirectional channel with the device, uh, which is interesting for information disclosure attacks. But the device usually supports many other printing protocols directly, like the uh, well-known internet printing protocol, um, line printer daemon, which is an old protocol known from the Unix world, and some newer printers even speak uh, server message block directly, which is um, known as uh, printer shares in the Windows world. Well, anyways, the important takeaway here is that forget about the channels. We are attacking actually the language interpreters, especially the PGL and PostScript interpreters. So the attacks are independent of the printing channel. In other words, anybody who has the ability to somehow print, can also be cloud printing or whatever, can perform the attack. Okay, that's the takeaway here. Well, now let me give you um, some basic introduction to uh, both printer languages, um, PGL and PostScript. PGL, the printer job language, was uh, developed by HP in the early 90s, and it um, is now some kind of de facto uh, language to control print jobs. What can you do with PGL? For example, you can manage um, settings like setting the paper size to A4, and setting the number of copies um, before switching the interpreter to the actual uh, document interpretation language that is going to follow, like, for example, PostScript. The interesting thing here is that PGL um, does not only allow you to make settings for the current print shop, but also for further print shops, so you can um, influence further print shops and the language has some other interesting features. For example, the standard allows you to access the printer's file system to an ordinary print job. Okay, our next language is um, PostScript. Well, what is PostScript? It was the very first product of Adobe. Some of us may, may remember it as a format for document exchange. However, it's been uh, largely uh, obsoleted by PDF nowadays, um, but actually, PostScript was designed for and is still heavily used on laser printers. And when you want to print a document, for example, some kind of uh, PDF document, what your printer driver does is, if you use PostScript as a printer driver, the document is translated to PostScript and sent to the printer uh, using one of uh, many printing channels uh, like port 9400. The important thing here is that PostScript is not some simple page description language or some simple markup language like HTML, PostScript is actually a Turing complete programming language. So from the viewpoint of theoretical computer science, given access to a PostScript interpreter already means code execution. Because any possible program or algorithm can be written in the PostScript language and executed on the printer. Okay, now let me come to some attacks. Our methodology in finding new attacks actually was pretty simple. We uh, studied the standards and some proprietary extensions of PostScript and PGL that were publicly available, and we uh, simply looked for uh, features of the language that can be used um, to, do, um, to actually perform attacks against um, printers. 
Before actually coming to the attacks, I'm going to uh, give you three uh, attacker models um, so you can see who actually is able to perform the attacks. Okay, first of all, we have got an attacker with physical access to the device. This is quite a strong attacker model, obviously. However, ask yourself, is your department's copy room really always locked? Is your conference's copy room really always locked? Now it's not. Okay, so we think in, in many uh, scenarios, on many, uh, in many companies, in many institutions, this may be a realistic attacker model. Okay, um, our next attacker model is the attacker with TCP IP network access to the printer. Well, again, you may ask, who would connect his printer directly to the internet? Well, actually, a lot of people, people do. This is um, current numbers from uh, Shodan, the search engine for devices, and Shodan currently uh, classifies um, over 30,000 computer systems as printers. Actually, it's a lot more out there, but uh, the classification of Shodan is not 100% uh, correct. Anyways, if an attacker just wants to attack some, some random printers, uh, she can just use Shodan and has alone in the US over uh, 10,000 devices uh, to attack. Okay, now our weakest attacker model is the, oh, excuse me. Um, how would uh, the attacker um, do this? Well, the attacker would use the internet and connect to port 9100 of the printer. And as I said, the interesting thing here is that the attacker gets a direct back channel from the device, which is important for all information disclosure attacks. Um, if there's some kind of firewall, and uh, as it should be, or the printer doesn't have a public IP address, of course, um, then um, in this scenario, it may also be interesting that an insider can perform the attacks uh, through a local area network. For example, uh, employees um, that want to access the print jobs, the payroll print jobs of the department manager. It is also interesting that most modern printers have Wi-Fi support by default, and most of them will automatically connect to an access point run by an attacker with a default SSID. And therefore, even an attacker who is not inside of the company's network, but who is physically close and can set up her own access point, can access um, the printer and potentially escalate her way into the network or read uh, print jobs. Okay, now our weakest attacker model is the web attacker. All she does is uh, she controls uh, the content or parts of the content of a website that is um, accessed by an employee within the same local area network, for example, as a printer that we are going to attack. And through the employee's web browser, the attacker can, for example, use JavaScript to um, post, um, for example, malicious postscript data to port 9100, not to the web port, to port 9100 of the printer, which is printed or executed depending on the uh, payload. Well, there's one drawback with this attacker model. Um, the attacker can only send data but not receive anything. Uh, I will come back to this later. Okay, now let's come to the actual attacks. We've categorized our attacks into four classes. Traditional denial of service attacks through print jobs, um, making the functionality of printing unavailable to other users. Bypassing protection mechanisms, for example, by resetting the device to factory defaults. Manipulation of other user, users' print jobs and information disclosure attacks, like access to the file system, to the memory, or obtaining other users' print jobs. Okay, now let me give you a small example for each class of attacks. Um, what always works is an infinite loop in PostScript. As said, PostScript is a programming language and you have all the constructs that a language um, allows you to have, like loops. You can only send this single line of code to the printer and the printer will uh, simply do nothing forever, usually until a legitimate user turns the device um, off and on again to be able to print again. Okay, that's pretty trivial. However, the takeaway is whenever the attacker has the possibility to print. Of course, she can uh, prevent others from printing. Now to the um, protection bypass attacks. Assume there is um, an administrator and he does a very good job and um, he has set passwords everywhere and also the printers are secured and our attacker wants to, to change some settings in the printer but she doesn't have the password. Well, 
what she can always do if she's a physical attacker is she can simply reset the device to factory defaults. Well, there are uh, documented um, uh, features like pressing certain keys uh, documented in the manuals of most uh, printer models to actually do that. If you're a physical attacker, pretty easy. However, the interesting thing is that, for example, on HP printers, this can be done through an ordinary print job by single this line of PGL code to the printer as a print job, the device will reset itself to factory defaults and wipe away all passwords. Okay, only if the attacker is able to print. Now one of my favorites, the manipulation of print jobs. Well, one way to do this is um, in PostScript to redefine the show page operator. PostScript consists of about 400 language functions called operators and um, for graphic manipulation and stack manipulation and so on. And one of the operators is the show page operator, which is contained on every page in every document and which actually tells the printer to put that page on paper. And you can actually override operators of the PostScript language, which can influence further print jobs. So when the operator, the show page operator, for example, is called in a further print job, the attacker's version is executed. And you can use this, for example, to um, put a smiley on uh, other users' print jobs, simple prank. But you can also do other stuff like be creative. Um, it's a programming language. So for example, you can search for certain text um, and then introduce some misspellings in the print jobs of a certain user that maybe you don't like. Or think of um, a contract that is um, being printed and um, the attacker wants to lower the price, for example. So here's when it gets um, pretty ugly. Okay, uh, last kind of attacks, um, information disclosure attacks. Um, I said there, there are proprietary extensions to PostScript and PGL to access the memory, which are supported by some printer models. However, the Standards of PostScript and PGL allow you to access the file system to uh, ordinary print jobs. Unfortunately, I don't have um, a printer model with me, so no, no demo today. And you can even capture print jobs based on the same principle that you can hook into subsequent print jobs and um, access this data. Well, in theory, this is easy. In practice, uh, it took us some time actually to figure it out how to do it. Um, for example, there were some challenges like where actually to, to store the, the data that you have captured. Um, if the printer has a hard disk and a file system, you can access this. It was uh, PostScript and uh, save the jobs there. However, um, on most devices, you can only access the uh, memory and you can define, for example, PostScript dictionaries, PostScript variables, uh, where you put the stored print jobs into. Okay, now, as I said, um, the web attacker is not able to, to get a back channel. The web attacker can only send data to the device using the employee's web browser as a carrier. She is not able to get any data back from the device. So why is this? You all know why, why this is. It's because of the same origin policy. So scripts can only access um, data from the same origin in terms of um, protocol, domain, and port. Okay, small example. Uh, we've got evil.org and, uh, and we've got some internal banking side. And while well, the attacker manages to, to lure an employee on uh, her website on evil.org, and um, evil.org now can execute JavaScript uh, in the employee's web browser and therefore, for example, uh, force an HTTP get request to some internal site. However, now the employee's browser says evil.org does not equal internal.bank.com and therefore you're not allowed to access this data. So no information disclosure for the web attacker. Well, however, in the printing context, um, there's something else, there's something new. Well, you've all heard of course, um, cross-origin resource sharing, which allows you a legitimate a website to make exceptions to the same origin policy and to say a certain re, um, uh, domain is, for example, allowed to access a certain resource. Now, however, again, in the context of printing, you got evil.org 
and we want to attack some internal printer, printer.bank.com, on port 9400. Okay, again, the employee um, somehow uh, fetches the website, for example, of the attacker, and the attacker can again uh, execute um, JavaScript. And the interesting thing here is that the attacker can, for example, post a PostScript file using JavaScript on port 9100, which is then interpreted on the printer. And as PostScript is a programming language, what you can do, for example, is you can echo um, arbitrary strings back to the channel, which is a network socket in this case. And the attacker can use this to simulate an HTTP server running on that printer, for example, including a course header that explicitly allows evil.org to access this data. The printer will echo this data back to the a network socket, and the browser thinks, oh, it's all fine because the printer um, allows evil.org explicitly to, to access uh, um, the data. And therefore, the web attacker again is able to perform all the attacks, including the information disclosure attacks. With other words, a malicious website can read your print shops. Okay. Um, well, now, um, Chrome and uh, Firefox are currently in the process of discussing to block this port. Um, we will see what uh, actually happens. Um, maybe this uh, will not uh, be possible uh, forever. Now let me uh, give you a short evaluation of the attacks. Um, one problem was obtaining enough printer models uh, to test the, the actual attacks. And what we actually wanted was an average of what is typically used in uh, a university or in an office context. And well, uh, how would you do it? Well, what we did in the end was um, we wrote a lot of emails uh, and knocked a lot of doors at the university and uh, asked the admins if they wouldn't have some devices for us uh, for science uh, to test. And uh, this worked pretty well in the end. Um, we got um, 20 printers um, from uh, eight different manufacturers. We installed the latest firmware to make sure all vulnerabilities found um, were not fixed uh, in between. Okay, here are the results. Um, on the left side, you can see the actual printer model. And um, on the right side, the denial of service category of attacks. Red means the device is vulnerable. And as said, for example, the infinite loop in PostScript works for almost all, devi all devices, but they are um, other possibilities, for example, you can redefine the PostScript show page operator to do nothing at all. So print jobs are still uh, executed, but they are not put to paper finally anymore. And PGL has a similar feature. You can um, use legitimate PGL commands to set the printer to offline mode, so uh, network users cannot access it anymore. It's just a legitimate feature of the PGL language. And we even managed to physically, um, to cause physical damage to eight of uh, 20 devices. Um, you need to know that um, all long-term values um, are stored in the printers in VRAM. That is, this is uh, normal for embedded devices to have some flash memory or EEPROM to, to, store, um, to store the values if the device doesn't have a hard disk. And, um, well, for example, the, the number of copies, uh, as you have seen in the example before, can be stored as a long-term value. However, uh, this NVRAM only allows you to, um, to, to, to for example, uh, have a million of write cycles. Then there's a physical limit. The, the unit will not allow new values to be written anymore. And you can write to the NVRAM through a single line of PC PCL code by setting the number of copies, for example. And you can also print a large print shop, which contains a million lines of code, which takes some time in the end, um, to uh, exceed the, uh, the possibility of the NVRAM to accept new values. The printer will still totally fine print from a mechanical point of view. But um, if your um, paper size, for example, is fixed to letter and you want to switch the long term to A4, um, well, and you can't, this may be a problem. Okay, our next uh, class of attack is the uh, protection uh, bypass uh, um, attacks. 
uh, using SNMP, the only kind of attack that is not um, uh, launched through a print shop, um, was possible for about uh, half of the devices. But on most HP devices, you could also reset the device to factory defaults um, using uh, ordinary print shops. Manipulating other users' print shops by infecting the device with PostScript malware also works for most of the devices. Some devices uh, had physically broken printing functionality, so we couldn't actually test them in the end. Accessing the memory only worked for brother-based devices. And access to the file system was only possible for two devices to access the whole file system. However, um, most devices allowed us to uh, access certain directories. And this is not necessarily harmless. Um, for example, on Oki devices, there is a directory called hidden, and all the settings are stored in this directory, and you have read and write access. And um, there are all the passwords, for example, not only for the device itself, because um, you can integrate your printer into your network um, on modern printers. So you can um, set, um, for example, you can integrate into your Windows domain, and then you have got um, an Active Directory password that is set on the printer and stored on the printer in this directory. You can use um, scan to email, so their email credentials can be stored on the device. You can even store um, Wi-Fi and IPsec pre-shared keys uh, on the printer and therefore integrate it into a secure network. So this may be one good example how an attacker can escalate herself into a company's network using the printer as a starting point. Capturing print jobs. Um, as introduced, uh, work for most um, PostScript based devices. It doesn't work for brother devices, for example. They use BR script, which is some um, PostScript clone, which is not 100% compatible with the Adobe standard. And also, um, credential disclosure attacks based on brute force against PGL and PostScript uh, works for most devices. Okay, now let me give you a short introduction to our Python tool, Brad. What can you do with it? Um, you can try, uh, you can do, do printer penetration tests with the tool and uh, you can analyze your own printer. It's uh, free software available on GitHub. How does it work? Well, if you want to pen test a printer, what you can do is you can uh, type a, a user-friendly command like ls and uh, the attacker command of uh, Brad, uh, the attacker module um, processes the, the command and translates it to PGL or PostScript and finally sends it to the printer, either using USB cable or port 9100 is currently supported. So for example, if you want um, to be in a PostScript mode, you simply type ls, you do not have to speak the PostScript language, and uh, Brad will translate it into the PostScript equivalent and um, get um, a PostScript response from the printer, and in the end, uh, the user gets um, the results of LS in a user-friendly manner, a file lister. Okay, you can do the, pretty much the same thing with PGL. Um, again, type LS, uh, PGL request is sent, PGL response is uh, parsed from the printer, and again, you get um, the results of LS in a user-friendly manner. Okay, um, there are lots of um, commands that are supported for file system access that you would expect from a typical uh, command line FTP client like uh, ls get put append delete for uploading and downloading files, but that's only for file system access. There are many more commands. Um, just uh, uh, give it a try. We've uh, implemented all the attacks um, that um, that uh, we know of uh, into the tool. Okay, now we sort of um, adapting the attacks to areas beyond printers, and this is pretty hard for PGL because it's pretty tightly bound to printers. However, PostScript is widely used in other areas. For example, you can import PostScript files in your uh, Microsoft Office or LibreOffice um, and therefore attack client software. But also some websites even process PostScript. I will come back to that uh, in a minute. Um, now let me show you an attack on um, Google Cloud Print. What is uh, which is still tightly bound to the printing area, of course, but not traditional printing. Um, what can you do with Google Cloud Print? You can basically print a file from anywhere in the world using a Google account um, um, by re first registering uh, a Google Cloud Print com compatible printer um, 
and then um, printing through your Google account. Okay, for example, you can target the printer. Um, if the printer is a PostScript printer, you can simply send a PostScript document through Google Cloud Print, and the cloud will simply forward it to the printer in your local area network, and this is just another way to attack your printer in the end, to perform the, the attacks um, just one more channel. However, you can also attack the Google Cloud directly. If you register a printer that says, well, I don't speak uh, PostScript, I only speak, uh, I prefer PDF, please give me PDF. Then if you send a PostScript file, what Google does is it converts it into PDF and sends it to the printer. However, converting PostScript actually means interpreting, means executing PostScript on the Google Cloud, uh, which can be really dangerous. In the case of Google, um, the Google guys are pretty bright and they had sandboxed uh, almost everything and um, so the impact was quite limited. All we found was a limited uh, information disclosure, um, being able to stat um, arbitrary files um, on, on the actual file system, really limited. Uh, still, we got some reward for this finding from Google. Okay, um, I said um, post script in the web. Well, where would it be? Um, logically, PostScript to PDF conversion websites would also have to convert and execute PDF. And most of them, almost all of them are vulnerable, at least to information disclosure attacks, sometimes even more. Um, however, there are not that many of them. But we can extend this to image conversion sites in general because um, many uh, image sites, um, conversion sites, allow you to upload EPS files. What is EPS? EPS is known as... Uh, a vector image file format, but actually it's just plain PostScript in the end. And we tested the uh, top 100 online image converters, and 48 of them were uh, vulnerable to um, accepting um, PostScript and executing PostScript. Okay, you say, well, my website doesn't convert any images, but maybe you have got something preview. Maybe um, your users are allowed to to upload some image um, for their profile. Maybe um, you make a preview of, of files that are uploaded. For example, Dropbox, um, you can upload an EPS file and a preview image will be created which executes PostScript. And here you can see an example of a file system listing. Also, it's limited the impact because Dropbox um, sandbox everything and uh, you can just uh, list the files within there a sandbox in their container, so it doesn't really matter, but not all sites uh, may have thought about such issues. Okay, um, uh, let me just give you uh, a practical example. Well, um, I haven't set um, a profile here yet for my um, OWASP account. Um, uh, I don't like putting up my image everywhere, so um, let's just see. Edit profile. Oh, where can I upload my photo? Here. So let's just try to, to upload some um, EPS file. Oh, no, they don't, no, no, they're safe. They don't allow me to do that. Or maybe, maybe if I just rename that to, to GIF, maybe that works. Oh, well, let's just try this again. Oh, 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 okay. We've executed um, PostScript um, on uh, that uh, system, um, which may or may not be um, uh, have a great impact. Um, the impact usually is from listing files to actually code execution, command execution, based on what the interpreter allows you to do. Uh, usually, GhostScript is used, and we have cre created a cheat sheet, which um, just performs um, about 20 of attacks that uh, most of them are publicly known or legitimate language features, you just have to upload uh, uh, it somewhere. PDF is also a good example um, uh, to use, rename it to, to PDF, change the content type, um, and it will automatically try to, to attack, um, to perform most of the attacks and uh, show you the results. Okay, now let me come to some uh, countermeasures. Well, actually, the standards are kind of, well, Broken because um, 
we only use legitimate features of the PostScript standards to capture print jobs. And actually, well, Adobe would have to, to update the standard, but I don't think such an old standard will be updated. Uh, so what can we do? Maybe not use PostScript at all anymore in the long term. Or we can somehow try to defend ourselves in other ways. Uh, for example, um, what you should never, ever, never, never, ever do is connect your printer directly to the internet. Uh, there was an incident in February where some gray hat hacker printed on 160,000 printers around the world, uh, and uh, he printed only ASCII art, so um, pretty much uh, friendly stuff. Um, but uh, he could also have, um, for example, tried to obtain print jobs or to physically damage the device. Okay, make sure especially in the university context uh, where everybody gets public IP addresses that you do not um, expose your devices, not only printers, to the internet. What else can you do? Teach your employees to really actually keep the copy room locked to make it not too easy for a physical attacker to, um, to, to infect your devices with PostScript malware. Administrators should think about sandboxing the printers into a virtual LAN that is only accessible through a hardened print server, which is currently the only way to actually mitigate the attacks. Printer vendors should think about undoing insecure design decisions like PostScript, like proprietary PGL commands, like data and code over the same channel. And finally, browser vendors uh, should consider blocking port 9100. It's really not their fault but they can actually prevent uh, cross-site printing attacks against um, printer devices. In the end, however, it is up to the, um, to the printer vendors to uh, roll out new firmware and to, um, to update the standards and to produce, new, um, produce uh, secure devices in the long term. Okay, let me come to a uh, conclusion. Uh, we've performed a systematic analysis of network printers and printing standards and proven that both PGL and PostScript from the standard and from the implementation is quite um, insecure. And we have applied to the attacks to different areas, for example, to websites. We still want to do some research, for example, as said, um, firmware updates um, are deployed as ordinary print jobs, and we've analyzed 1,400 uh, firmware files from the top 10 vendors, and all of them do it like this. Accessing the fax through a print shop may also be interesting because the attacker gets access to the phone line. And 3D printers may also be an interesting area of research to adapt the attacks to. Okay, let me come to an end of the talk. Um, the, uh, the printer exploitation toolkit, Brad, is uh, freely available on GitHub. Uh, you can use it to, to analyze your printer, give me some feedback. And if you are interested in the technical details of the attacks, we have set up a wiki where you can uh, read everything in detail. Okay, do you have any questions? That's pretty much a good question. No, most printers will interpret is it as a plain text print job and print it to paper. So the HTTP header of the attacker, including the origin where the attack came from, um, may be printed on paper. So if you find that on your printer, you may be a victim of a cross-site printing attack. You can actually prevent uh, this um, by disabling printing functionality first, um, but that is a bit tricky and model specific. Um, so Yes, the attacker may be a bit noisy. No, it's not a new name. Uh, actually, it was uh, the, the uh, term cross-site printing um, and uh, sending uh, data to, uh, to port 9100 of a printer to a web browser uh, was invented by Aaron Weaver in 2007 already. Uh, without the course proving uh, thing, so the term is pretty much old. Uh, 
Uh, sure, yeah. Hmm. Okay, the question is, is if uh, we uh, can use the printer to escalate uh, really into the network, and um, actually, no, not in a generic way, like uh, PostScript does not allow you, for example, to, from the standard, to speak TCP IP and therefore escalate yourself into the network. There's a proprietary extension, for example, new Xerox printers allow you to uh, speak TCP IP in PostScript, but it's not generic. On other printers, you can access the file system, overwrite some uh, RC startup files, and therefore get code execution, and then again, uh, try to get into the network. Um, but this is very model-specific and not generic. Okay then, thanks again.